Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Thank you for joining me. I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Soria, a UAG alum today. I'm gonna to ask her a series of questions that I hope you'll find useful as you go along your med medical education. All right, so let's get started. So thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed for my YouTube channel, Dr. Soria. I greatly appreciate um, your time um, to help me and all of the viewers that are watching this, not only like this year, but hopefully, like, you know, in the years to come when they get to this point in their, in their med medical education. Um, so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, Roxanne. I really, you know, appreciate, you know, your advocacy for UAG students and I really appreciate you having your YouTube channel and you know, I'm always happy to be here, like answering all your questions and, you know, any questions anyone else has, you know, definitely reach out to me. Thank you so much. Um, so in, uh, for like the introductory questions, I was thinking of asking you just like background information, just so that our viewers can know a little bit more about you. And then we'll get to like the nitty gritty information that um, we can like use in our in our years. OK, so the first question would be, uh, where did you go for undergrad and many and if you did any education like post back or masters before UAG? So for my undergrad, I went to the University of California, San Diego. I went there from 2011 to 2015. I was a biochem cell bio major. Um, and I actually did not do any post programs or any masters. And fun fact, everyone, I went to UCSD and so did Dr. Soya, which is so crazy because we were in the same um, pre-health program, but I guess we just kind of missed each other. I don't know. like. Maybe we interacted, I just don't remember. It was so long ago, but, <laughs> but I'm really, really grateful that like we've crossed paths once again and it's crazy that it happened with UAG. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so when did you start at UAG? Was it in August or January? And if, and why, if you made a, like a decision for either? So I did start off cycle and you know, it's something I really thought about before actually starting medical school, just because I knew that would kind of throw off my schedule, I would say a little bit for residency, but I did decide to start in January of 2017. Um, just because I took a gap year, you know, I was kind of, you know, looking into medical schools at that point that, you know, I was kind of taking a year off to work. Um, and so by the time, you know, August came around, you know, I wasn't really feeling confident in my GPA, um, you know, for American Medical School. So I was looking into the Caribbean and, you know, um, along my research, I found UAG and I felt like, you know, it would be a great opportunity just because I had the family already in Mexico and because I am Mexican-American, um, I just feel like that transition would have been a little bit easier for me. So, you know, I was, by the time um, like November, October came around, I was kind of like very eager to already start um, medical school. And so that's why I kind of decided to join the January class. I didn't want to wait all the way till August again for the next year. I don't know, for me, I was scared to go off track. So like very brave for you to just say like, let's start it. <laughs> and hey, it worked out for you. So it's definitely possible for everybody that's like, thinking about starting in January, um, it's it's not like that big of a difference and you will find a way like Dr. Saria will advise right now. And just to kind of add to that, you know, in my original class, um, there were about five other people too that we were all in the same, you know, off cycle and we started in January and we were able to match too. So it's definitely something that's doable. You just have to be very dil diligent with your schedule. <laughs> so you kind of mentioned it. Um, congratulations on your successful match right after UAG Medical School. Um, that's what you're currently doing, right? That's right. So thankfully, <laughs> by the grace of God, I was able to start residency. Um, you know, while well, I applied while I was still at UAG, but I was able to start pretty quickly after finishing UAG. It's wonderful. So um, from my understanding, you're in pathology, correct? 
Yes, so yeah, I'm in a um, joined APCP pathology program um, in California, and I absolutely love my program. It's very amazing. I definitely am so lucky to have been, like, you know, to have gotten my match spot. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the pathology specialty is for those who haven't, like, heard about it. Yeah, so pathology is definitely that hidden gem, I would say, in medicine. Not a lot of people know about it, I think, primarily because there aren't, like, there isn't a lot of exposure to it as medical students. But basically, pathology is, you know, really diagnosing, you know, patients, um, you know, um, based on tissues. So that can be either like an entire organ, you know, that we can take out like an appendix, or it can be like a bone marrow, or it can be blood running studies on that, you know, so every time we're putting in orders for chemistry values or CBCs, um, that all kind of like gets overrun and overseen by pathology. And you know, we really focus on the diagnostic aspect of medicine. So we're just behind the scenes. <laughs> Wonder, it, it sounds very interesting, honestly. And I personally, I I was one of those who didn't know about it until I like heard about you matching and I was like wait a minute let me look into this program what is it yeah. all about <laughs> um, how long is uh, the pathology uh, residency Um, so pathology is four years, um, but you know, that varies depending on what you want to do in pathology. So there are two major branches of pathology. There's the AP side and there's CP. So AP is anatomic pathology. So, you know, in that you're really diagnosing like um, specimens that come out of patients, like tumors, um, any other benign processes too. And also forensic pathology follows, um, it goes underneath that branch of pathology, the AP side. And then you have CP pathology, which is clinical pathology. That's more like chemistry values. Um, hematopathology also follows under CP. Um, so, you know, there are some programs where you can either do AP or CP, and so those are just like three years. But if you want to do both combined, which is highly recommended just for job marketing in the future, um, it's four years. Um, and then you can do obviously fellowships afterwards, which are highly recommended as well. And those are an additional one to two years. Awesome. So there are fellowships as well. Almost like, yeah, there's a lot of fellowships <laughs> in pathology. <laughs> lots of to choose from definitely <laughs> oh that's wonderful that's good to know um okay so next question would be okay so now i'm transitioning a little bit over into uag and my first question would be what resources did you use while studying for your first two years at uag and do you recommend them Yeah, so during MS1 and MS2, I would say I was very focused on the UAG curriculum and I wasn't very board centric at the time. But looking back, I feel like I should have been a little more board centric at the time and incorporating like other resources, you know, to kind of start like prepping for boards. Um, so that's one mistake that I did. But while I was in MS1 and MS2, I was, you know, um, reading the textbooks <laughs> where um, that were recommended by the professors. So for example, Robin's Pathology. I read a lot of that, um, you know, because it corresponded with the lectures and that helped me like do very well in the classes. But honestly, by the time I got to board preparation, like I felt like I wasn't very, you know, prepared for boards. Um, so, you know, that was one mistake I did. So what I recommend for UAG students to do is obviously focus on their UAG grades. Um, because, you know, those things will get factored into your MSPE, which is one of the components of the EVAS application. So I do think grades are so important, but obviously boards are very, very, <laughs> probably more important. Um, so I would have started incorporating, you know, like Anki cards or Master the Boards during MS1 and 2. Perfect. Thank you so much for for, for your advice. Um, because yes, it, it's kind of scary to balance between UEG curriculum and board studying-ish at the same time. Um, and you mentioned MSPE for the grades. Um, so do the grades appear as like numbers as the one through 10 when, when you received it? Were you able to see them? I'm not sure if that's the thing. So you actually can request to see your MSPE. Um, 
But, you know, this is how the process works. So when you're, you know, about to apply for residency, what you do is you go ahead and let the school know to start the evaluation for you. Um, they won't actually show it to you. They just kind of upload it into eBrass. Um, but, you know, if they do end up making a mistake, um, you know, unfortunately, that is something that happened to me <laughs> this year. There was a mistake on my MSPE and I didn't find out about it until I was back in the interview. Um, so obviously, like I started freaking out and I like told the UAG about the issue and they were able to fix it. And then once they fixed it, they sent me the corrected form just to like kind of ease my nerves and show me that they corrected <laughs> what the, the mistake that they had done. Um, but MSPE, from what I saw on it, they didn't have the exact grades that goes mostly on your transcript, the one through 10 scoring system, um, but they will have basically like a class average. They kind of give you like a graph of like how well you did in your courses um, in comparison to the other um, students. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't be like your typical um, transcript where it has your letter yeah, grade. Yeah, they kind of like give you like, they show like the statistical, I guess, analysis of your performance compared to your other classmates. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, okay. So in terms of extracurricular activities, um, I was wondering if you did any during medical school. Um, I actually did. Um, you know, I feel like overall it was a lot easier, or it was easier to be involved in the extracurriculars during MS1 and 2, um, just because you're right there on campus and there's a lot of like student activities. So during MS1 and 2, I did do medic, which is like a very, very amazing experience just to be able to go out and help like the rural communities in Guadalajara. Like it was just an like, overall an amazing experience. Um, and I also was involved in AMSA as well. So we did a, like a lot of events throughout the years, um, fundraising events, blood drives, um, some clinics. So yeah, that was a great experience as well. Um, and then to be honest, during MS3 and MS4, it got a little bit of harder to be involved in extracurricular activities just because you're doing like away rotations. And on top of that, at the same time, I was studying for boards. So I kind of found it hard to kind of balance that with the extracurriculars. And it was kind of hard to find ex like um, UAG sponsored extracurriculars um, while I was like in Las Vegas doing my away rotations. Oh, yes, that that makes sense. <laughs> OK, so in terms of research. Did you do any research during medical school? So I would say I, I did not do any research. Um, so I would only say that was the weakest part of my ERAS application just because um, at the time, I didn't feel like UAG really provided any research opportunities for students. Um, but I know, you know, you can, you know, really go out there, you know, if you are interested in research and you know, kind of asking around to see if anyone has any research opportunities. Um, I know Dr. Zabala sometimes has some research um, going on, but I'm not really sure how many people like got involved in my class. Um, but I know she might have something available if someone is interested in research. So would you recommend to, to get research experience since you mentioned that it was if you are genuinely interested in research, I would definitely pursue it. It is something I would recommend if you were interested in going into maybe like into an academic um, residency program, just because a lot of times for those programs, research can be a required component. So it can definitely strengthen your application. Um, but you know, there are some programs out there that are a little more community based that might not focus on that. So I would really just say, you know, do it because you're honestly interested in it and you know, not just because you want to put it on your CV. Um, so I would say, yeah, just do it if you are interested, but I, I would recommend it if you are interested in going into an academics. <laughs> okay, that makes sense, thank you. My next question would be, did you have uh, any mentors? Um, I wouldn't say that I had a mentor um, like per se. I had a, like this one classmate um, that was really helping me throughout the entire like ERAS application process because a lot of her friends were already residents. So she kind of already knew everything about ERAS and how to apply and the timeline. So I definitely give her a bunch of credit 
it on like my success during the match. Um, but I wouldn't really say like I had like faculty mentors um, or even like a, like relationships with other pro program coordinators or you know program directors. No, I did not have mentors like that. So it's definitely still possible to just you know c continue doing you, and then <laughs> it'll all fall into place. Because yeah, it's fine. Finding mentors is a little bit. Um, like difficult you know especially now with covid where everything's like online no yeah i definitely think it's a little bit like um it can give you more guidance as a mentor i would recommend having one if you can um but yeah i didn't have one and i was able to be fine so it is still possible to do okay if like you're freaking out because you can't find a mentor like you, you will be okay too <laughs> that's good that's good to hear um, so next question will be more on step one. When did you take step one? I took step one in March 2020, right before the ProMed centers started shutting down um, due to the pandemic. So I definitely got lucky in that sense if I took it right before they shut down. Oh, okay. And um, what what year is medical school? It was during my, my fourth year of medical school. Fourth year. Okay, and then um, next question would be what resources did you use and what would you recommend them? So, my main resources were um, UWorld, Sketchy Micro, and Sketchy Farm, um, Pathoma. So, I definitely recommend those three resources definitely to kind of like really get your concepts down and really grasp the knowledge. And then, first aid, I would kind of use it as an adjunct to kind of just review, like, chart like information. Um, but I think you definitely have to go more into depth than uh, first aid is. But yeah, I definitely recommend using those resources. Um, I would definitely do U World, definitely at least one first pass. Um, and if you can do a second pass, too, just because that information is definitely crucial for step one. <laughs> Okay, that's good to hear. Um, I've always heard about Sketchy, but I wasn't sure about Sketchy Farm. So it's good to, to hear that as well. <laughs> How long did you prepare for, for step one? Um, so like I said, I hadn't really been, during MS1 and 2, I wasn't very like, you know, um, board centric at that time. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to the end of MS2, I thought, okay, like I'll study for boards for three months and I'll be able to take it at the beginning of like third year before I start rotation. But honestly, I was not prepared for it and I wasn't getting the results that I wanted to see. Um, so I didn't feel safe taking it at the time. So then I spent like a full additional year studying for it um, to really, you know, build up my knowledge, build up my base. I had to, you know, kind of build like a strong foundation, you know, um, to be able to get like a higher step score. Um, just because like that's something I really wanted to try to achieve as high as I could. So I just felt like that would be something to kind of get my foot into the door with program. Um, so I really wanted to get like a high, as high as I could of the step score. So I took like a year studying for it. Um, and you know, at the same time I was balancing, um, clinical rotations as well. So that, I think that kind of prolonged the process as well, you know, yeah. you know, some rotations were heavier than others. And I think that definitely prolongs it as well. Yes. Major props for, for doing that. Like that sounds very difficult because it's like, you're in rotations for most of the day and then you go home and you have to study on your own. Like nobody's telling you this is the due date, so props. So that's why I recommend people start studying like during MS2 definitely for boards just because, you know, you don't want to be stuck in my situation where you have to start balancing the two because it does get a little bit hard. That was actually my next question. Like, do you recommend taking it before rotations Um, yeah, so I definitely recommend um, taking it before your clinical rotations if you feel like, you know, you have reached like your max, your maximum knowledge that you will know for step one. Um, just because, you know, it is a little bit harder to balance the book, like two of them at the same time, clinical rotations and step one material. And just because if you do end up pushing it back, and you are like studying for it during your third year, you're kind of missing out on your step two knowledge, which you should be studying during your clinical rotation. So it kind of just pushes you back um, in a lot of ways. 
Um, so I would recommend taking at the MS2 if you can. So that's why I recommend preparing for it during MS2 um, at the same time with UAG curriculum. But, you know, it does happen to a lot of UAG students where we kind of come out of MS2 not really board centric and not prepared for boards. So it is still possible to take it, you know, into your third or fourth year. It's not the end of the world. Um, but, you know, that will kind of just cut down your time on the time you have to prepare for step two if you plan um, on doing ERAS during your fourth year of medical school. It kind of just, um, I guess, condenses everything into a shorter timeline <laughs> the more you prolong step one. Yes, exactly. Um, so when when did you take step two? Or you yeah. had to take both CS and CK, correct? So um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, they actually shut down CS. So I was part of that cohort where they ended up canceling CS for the time being due to the, pan to, due to the pandemic. Um, but CK I did take, and I took that actually in October. Okay. So yeah, I took step one in March 2020, and then step two CK I took that October 2020. So all in the same year, my fourth year. But like I said, the timeline was very crunched, um, so I don't recommend doing that. But you know, if you do find yourself in that same uh, situation, it still is possible. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's possible to study for both and apply <laughs> and interview. Oh my goodness. Yeah, don't recommend it, but you know, if you find yourself in that situation, um, si se puede. <laughs> si se puede, yes. Um, so in terms of signing up for step one and step two, it's through the e ECFMG um, program, correct? Yes, that's correct. So it will all be through the ECFMG website. Um, and then I just want to throw this out there just because I want you guys to learn from my mistakes. But I actually, you know, signed up for step one right away at the end of my MS2 because I thought, oh, I'm going to be ready for step one. Um, I didn't know how hard it was going to be. And I was like, oh, like my grades are good. Like I'm going to be able to ace this exam. <laughs> and then my exam, like my practice exam said otherwise. <laughs> so yeah, I actually ended up like signing up for it and then I didn't take it so I lost like the $800 or $900 no. um, yeah one round and that was like something I was like really sad about because like they give you like time to like prolong it to you know yeah. but even with the extension I still didn't feel ready for the exam and so I was kind of like okay should I go for like a mediocre score and just take it or should I wait a little bit longer and score higher so I guess it's up to the individual person but for me i felt like it was worth pushing it off re-registering it wasting more money get a higher score but i guess that's up to the person but for me i don't like to leave things up to chance so i would rather be sure oh thank you for sharing yes um i was actually going to ask you like when um when did you sign up for step one or like how how soon before taking it should we sign up Yeah, so definitely my recommendation now is do not sign up until you have that practice exam in your hand of that score that you will feel com confident with and comfortable with, you know. So for everyone, that's going to look a little bit different, I think, depending on what specialty um, you decide to go into, because, you know, every specialty does have different average step scores and, you know, being IMGs, we do have to be cognizant of the fact that we are kind of evaluated at a different level than, I guess, American graduates. So I would always like recommend maybe shooting above like 10 points, you know, um, just to make, kind of make yourself stand out, um, you know, from the other IMG applicants as well. Um, so, you know, I would recommend signing up for the exam when you have that solid practice exam score that you feel confident and comfortable with. Um, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I would do like a series of practice exams. And if you're like feeling like you're hitting an average that you're comfortable with, that's when I would decide to go ahead and pay for the exam. And it will probably take like uh, three to four weeks to actually get your permit. Um, so once you hit that level, I would just keep studying for those three or four weeks um, so that you don't lose your knowledge. But yeah, I think it's a very expensive exam. So you don't want to make the mistake that I did and you know, signing up for it before you even know that you're ready to take the exam, basically. Okay, yes, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, 
because yeah myself like I know that I'm kind of one of those eager people too and I'm thinking like well should I sign up like I know ACFMG is a little bit slow like maybe the process of getting my date will be too slow so I should sign up sooner than later so I appreciate that <laughs> thank you um okay so in terms of Step to CK, um, what resources did you use? Uh, again, the same question, and do you recommend them? So for Step to CK, I use UWorld again. Um, so they have a lot of like great questions um, to kind of help you prepare for CK. Um, in my opinion, CK was a little bit harder than Step 1, um, just because the clinical finance were a little bit longer, the patients get a little more complicated <laughs> compared to Step 1. Um, so in addition, I also use online med ed, which I'm sure you've heard of, but yeah, um, the, you know, those are some free videos you can use too. There's also some subscriptions that they have on the website too. Um, but yeah, I recommend watching those videos as well. And then um, something that I didn't use, but I wish I would have used a little more is Divine Intervention Podcast. So it's like a resident, um, he has like his own, I guess, um, podcast channel and then you just look up Divine Intervention Podcast and he basically like does these like great podcasts, like you can just listen to it while you're driving, you know, wherever, work, school, um, or when you're on a run and he basically talks about like high yield information. Um, so I would recommend using that. And then also another hidden resource um, is YouTube. <laughs> There's some good people on YouTube that have great like step one and step two content. Uh, for example, there's like a biostat guy who's on there. Uh, I always forget his name. His name was like Dr. Um, oh gosh, uh, Dr. Neil or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's no, okay. But yeah, he, he's great. You just look at biostat. Um, US, USMLE want step one and you'll find it on there um, and then um, dirty USMLE too um, he's also really good he has like some good content to help you like remember kind of like these difficult concepts in medicine um, so those are some things um, I recommend as well perfect thank you so much I'll look for that biostats guy <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so now um, it, now I'm kind of moving forward to like third year and more so towards uh, core clinical rotations. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, so during third year, you know, UAG kind of makes you take all of the core rotations. Um, and so basically they will change the order of them, um, but each semester is kind of already set up for you. So, you know, I think the first semester is like family medicine, internal medicine, um, and, you know, they kind of already you know, like figure it out for you. It's just like the, I guess the um, rotation schedule you get is, it might be different from your other classmates. Um, but, you know, overall, I feel like third year was pretty strong. But then again, like I said, I feel like I wish I, you know, if I can go back, I wish I could have like studied the step two material along with those core rotations during third year. So that made would have made the information a little bit easier to digest, you know, at the time. Um, I think it makes you a little bit like better prepared for your rotations. Um, just cause like during third year, you know, you are gonna be seeing patients by yourself. Um, you're gonna have to basically do your soap. Um, so you're gonna have to do your own physical exam. Um, you know, you will have to be doing vital signs at some times too, um, your own interviews, and then you kind of sum up everything for your attending. And then depending on the attending, you will have to be presenting your assessment and plan. Um, so I think, you know, to be like well prepared for that, um, I think UAG did, did a pretty good job for us as well, I think, um, in terms of like preparing us like on like how to present patients. Um, I'm not sure if the format has changed a little bit, but back in the day we had our class called um, D DSB. I'm not sure if they've changed it, um, but we used to have like we used to have these like mock sessions, and so that was helpful. But also what helped me too was that I was a scribe um, in undergrad too, so I feel like that kind of helped me um, prepare. I don't know in a weird way, I guess, <laughs> for those presentations. Yeah. Um, and. 
I think, you know, another thing that would have been helpful, which I didn't do was, you know, really knowing my clinical knowledge based on like step two information. I wish I could have correlated all that together at the same time during my third year, but because I pushed my step one back, I wasn't able to do that. Okay, noted. So yeah. try to take step one before clinical rotation. Yeah. That way you can study along as you go for step two uh, during your rotation. And did you do your uh, third year rotations all in one place? I did. Um, so I stayed in Las Vegas for about a year and a half. So that was my entire third year and then the first semester of my fourth year. And then, so now for your fourth year, I believe that's um, all electives? Yeah, so fourth year is all electives with the exception of emergency medicine. We all have to do that one. But yeah, for the remainder, you can choose which electives. Um, and then UAD does give like a point system on which electives have a certain amount of points. So per semester, you have to hit a certain amount of points. And so that kind of helps you dictate, you know, which um, electives you have to do to, you know, reach the amount of points that you need. Um, but, you know, for me, what happened during my fourth year is um, my pathology rotation, um, because they didn't have a lot of like pathology elective rotations. They had one in um, New York and one in Chicago, but the New York one shut down because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I had to um, do it the last part of the last semester of my fourth year, which was very stressful because you know the ERAS application was coming out and I ne needed my letter of recommendation so that was a very stressful thing so that's something I would like to emphasize on really figuring out your fourth year schedule according to um, you know for example if you're going to do like a specialty that isn't a core rotation like radiology pathology um, I would really recommend you know trying to fix your fourth year and trying to get those letters of recommendation a little bit earlier and not pushing it into ERAS um, season because <laughs> it becomes stressful. Let's say the ideal situation would have been to take pathology in the beginning of your fourth year. Right, yeah. yeah? Oh, okay, <laughs> just making sure because so I can think of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something definitely to think about too in your fourth year. <laughs> uh, so you, you didn't do one away rotation, right? You did it part of uh, UAG? Yeah, it was all part of UAG. Um, I know we do have the opportunity to do away rotations with a program called Vsauce. So UAG does participate in that. You just have to ask for access to that program. And I believe you contact Arturo, if you guys know who he is. Um, yeah, so he's basically in charge of the clinical rotations and he can give you access to the Vsauce application. Yes, um, I'll, leave, I'll leave his email in the description box. Um, that's where you can you can email him because I, I did that I think in the beginning of my second year um, and I emailed Vsauce and they said oh email Arturo and I was like okay <laughs> hello yeah. and then it was super, super simple you just ask for the um, for like the login or something and they, they give you access but through that you find different programs or different schools that allow you to do away rotations is that is that correct and that's where you apply so that basically will give you like a pre-selected list of programs that do accept basically uag students to rotate with them um, but something i do want to say um, a lot of those rotations because i had i was really interested in doing those but one limiting factor was step one so a lot of those rotations, even though I wanted to do them, I couldn't do them because they required step one. And at the time, I was still in third year, um, you know, trying to apply for my fourth year, but I still didn't have that step one score until the beginning of my fourth year. And so that's another reason why I recommend taking step one as early as possible, because otherwise it will limit, you know, you won't be able to, you know, really do any of those Vsauce um, away rotations. Also, something I would like to like say about the VSAS um, is that you know those rotations do cost money too. So if it's something that you need to start budgeting for during your MS1 and MS2, that's something I recommend doing because a lot of things really add up during your fourth year. You know, with board exams, 
um, ERAS applications and everything to prepare you, you know, headshots, all of that really adds up. So I definitely recommend kind of pre-budgeting for that, maybe make a different savings account just for that because it will add up quickly. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm scared, <laughs> but thank you. Um, in terms of ERAS now, um, so did you apply to ERAS before getting ECFMG certified or did you do ECFMG certification before? So I actually applied without being ECFMG certified. Um, so because one of the steps to get ECFMG certified is your diploma. So you can like uh, start applying for it. Um, you can like pay the fee, but technically they won't finish the process until you actually submit them a copy of your UAG diploma. So that's actually another thing that I struggled with um, just because, you know, programs, they wanted to interview me and they actually did interview me. But when it came down to like submitting the rank order list, um, some programs didn't rank me because I didn't have the ECFMG certification by that time. Um, just because UAG is a little bit slower when they're actually making the diplomas after you, so I finished in December 2020, but they didn't actually give me my diploma until I believe March or April um, after I graduated. And so that kind of slowed things down for me and the rank order list I believe was like due in like March. And so I didn't have that certification because I didn't have the diploma. So that kind of like backtracked things for me. And yeah, I think it can make things a little bit complicated. So that's something I would think about too while you're applying is, you know, kind of start looking at the timeline of when you'll have your ECFMG certification. That way you can be transparent with your programs when you're applying and just kind of letting them in the loop and letting them know when you'll have your ECFMG certification. Yeah, I'm trying to think like if, because I, I believe you can, I mean, obviously, right? You went and you were you were interviewed by um, schools without having the ECFMG certification. But if you would have had it maybe like um, a month before, or I don't know when they do the ranking, um, then it would have worked out like that? I think if I would have had it like before, um, I could have maybe got, gotten ranked by a couple more programs. Um, but you know, when the school, like when it's getting closer to rank order list, cause you know, the interviews kind of happen, let's say anywhere between like October and you know, this year was a little bit different because they kind of like pushed back the cycle. So they actually went all the way up to February. So that's kind of when the interview season was um, this past year. Um, but basically what happens is that some programs are, if programs are still interested in you, they will still like interview you without your ECFMG certification. But again, it depends on the program. Um, other programs won't even look at you <laughs> if you're not certified. It just really depends on the program. Um, but you know, for the programs that are still interested, they might interview you still, but then maybe they won't rank you if you don't have your ECFMG certification. And then there's another subgroup of programs that will interview you and rank you without your ECFMG certification. So it really just depends on each program. Yeah, every program really differs in different aspects. Oh, okay. And would you recommend using like Freda or Match Your Resident to find that information? Or how did you, how did you find out? Yeah, so I actually used Match Resident. I didn't use Freda at all. Um, so Match Resident was helpful for me to kind of apply smarter, not harder. You know, I didn't want to spend exorbitant amounts of, you know, um, money during the, the cycle. So I kind of like tailored my list to like my step one score, ECFMG certification status. Um, so you kind of use those and Match Resident kind of helped me in that sense. But what I did notice that what, not all the programs had that information on the Match Resident. Um, so I actually reached out to some programs as well that I was really interested in and kind of told them about, you know, where I was in the process of the ECFMG certification. And I kind of reached out to the program coordinators to kind of verify that information. Oh, that's awesome. So you can reach out and just ask basically <laughs> yeah basically yeah if, especially if you're really interested in a certain program i would definitely reach out to the program coordinator and just kind of let them know what your situation is um but also i think you know last cycle was very 
special just because of the pandemic. So I think programs are a little more understandable just because everything was kind of postponed and everything was very slow. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens this year with that. Um, okay, in terms of ERAS, since you mentioned that you um, used Match of Resident, how many schools did you end up applying to? I was applying um, to around 60 schools. Oh, really? Um, yeah, just because there was like 130 um, programs basically in pathology. So like I said, I wanted to apply smarter, not harder. So I kind of like looked at my stats and I kind of narrowed it down to programs that were basically more IMG friendly. <laughs> so I didn't want to apply for programs that have like no IMGs. Um, so I, I just didn't want to waste my money or programs that needed to have the ECFMG certification for the application. So I just like that kind of eliminated about like, half of the programs. Okay, no, that's great. That's, that's good. Um because you're right there's so many there's so many programs out there and you, you just don't have that amount of resources to just yeah. <laughs> apply and then also interview at and um, so that that all adds up um, so in terms of interviews do you mind sharing how many interviews you were uh, offered I guess yeah. part. so I got offered um, 25 interviews um, so as an IMG, I took all of them um, just because I, I honestly was interested in all of the programs that extended that invitation to me. I wanted to learn more about them, but also in its IMGs, you know, we hear about like American grads who maybe go on like 10 to 15 interviews but as IMGs. We don't really know what, you know, you want to like increase your chances of matching basically. So you want to go on, on as many interviews as you really can. 25 is amazing. <laughs> I want that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. And I'm really happy that you found the program that was like perfect for you. And it's in California, which is even crazier because you're an IMG and just California is so competitive to US medical students, you know? So, yeah, definitely. But yeah, I think definitely like, um, you know, just make yourself stand out um, and then, you know, just go like be genuine, be yourself, share your like your story. Don't like try to make up anything that's like not you. Just be honest. And like, honestly, I feel like that really goes a long way and programs see that. And I think that's definitely what made me stand out, I think, to my program. And they really appreciated that. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that because um, you're right. Like, you never know if you have to like change a little bit, you know, just to, to fit in, but I'm glad. Um, in terms of looking out for for residency programs, I, I know that you mentioned um, the stats, like how many IMGs are in each residency program, but is there anything else that you recommend that we look out for? Um, so I think, yeah, an important like factor is going to be seeing actually, because like, I think when you go on to like most of the websites, you can like see like a roster of the residents that they have. So I think that's always like a good way to kind of start evaluating the program, like how IMG friendly they are. Um, because, you know, some programs will say that they accept um, IMG applications. Um, but, you know, if you're not really seeing any IMGs like residents, that's kind of like, hmm, maybe like, I don't know like if they are truly, um, you know, evaluating IMGs on the same level or I don't know, I guess it makes you question. Um, so that's something I would look at, like the current residents that they have. Um, also something I would definitely recommend to look out for is like the culture of the program. I think resident where, like wellness is getting more awareness now just because of how stressful residency is. So it's always good to be at a program that you feel well supported at, that you find a good group of residents and faculty, your attendees. I think all of that is something that I think should be valued very highly when you're evaluating programs. Yes, okay, thank you so much. So that's just like um, looking into their program, what what um, additional things they offer, right? Like, I don't know, like uh, med mental health, like, yes. or like family planning or stuff like that, correct? Yes, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, okay I'm nearing the end of my ERAS questions. 
but I wanted to ask you about your hobby section. Um, how many hobbies did you put and can you explain a little bit more about that? <laughs> I think the hobbies was my favorite part of the application. So I think that I put like maybe 10 different hobbies. I don't think there's like an exact number you have to put, but honestly, if I had to like guess a number, I would say anywhere from five to 10. But basically it's just like, honestly, just letting yourself stand out on a personal level, kind of showing these programs who you are and like what you're interested in. And honestly, during the interviews, it was like a big talking point in a lot of my interviews. Like some people just um, asked me about my hobby sections and that's all we talked about for like 20 minutes. So I think it's like definitely the fun part of the application. And it's just, you know, the programs, when they ask you for an interview, you've already met their criteria of like, you know, being able to be in their program. They know like, okay, you met our step one, step two requirement your grades like you know you're obviously qualified basically to be in their program but you know what they're really expecting you for during the interview is like how who are you as a person like what is your personality like can they see themselves working with you as a resident basically so they just want to evaluate who you are and you know what you're interested in like just as a person <laughs> okay okay that's good so don't be shy with your hobbies <laughs> yeah definitely not <laughs> okay um so for the eras i also see that there is a section to put certificates um i know that ueg doesn't really offer like or uh, correct me if i'm wrong like fourth year like certificates at the end like how u.s medical students put um so i was wondering if you put anything there Um, I actually didn't put anything down for the certificates. <laughs> okay, that's that's good. Yeah. That it makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I can do it. You guys can do it too. <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you for being so honest with us. Um, okay, something else was how many letters of recommendations um, did you did you get? So for me, I got three letters of recommendation. So I got um, one in my specialty, pathology, um, and then I got one in internal medicine and one in family medicine. So I would really recommend, what I recommend students do is that they go to open houses. Um, normally, if you are on med Twitter, you'll see that every specialty kind of has like these open houses to kind of learn about the residency programs. And that's a great opportunity to really see what programs are looking for an applicant um, and so basically you know I had did I did that for pathology and a lot of them were really saying you know you can have more but you know three is the minimum but what they really wanted to see was at least one being from a pathologist so you don't need to have all of them from pathology but at least one from pathology so open houses to see the specifics yeah. of your own specialty mm -hmm. if they recommend like um, what specialty is it like what physician right exactly. <laughs> okay <laughs> we're almost done um and i i wanted to ask you if there's anything that you included in your eras that we have not talked about um so i think the other component that i don't think we really talk about is the the personal statement i think you know that's a really big like factor because some programs i think it depends but some directors they start off with the personal statement that's what i've heard um so what they'll do is they kind of like you know don't they don't really look at anything else they'll start with personal statement and so i think that's really a chance for you to kind of stand out you know show who you really are and why you're genuinely interested in the program um and something that i would recommend to do to students is that you know, you can tailor your personal statement for different programs. That's actually what I did. So I was able to match up my number one program. And so I did a separate personal statement for that program. And so you can basically, when you're applying, you can do different personal statements for different programs. Um, at the time, I only did two, one for my general and then one for my number one program. <laughs> So okay. that seems to work out, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if you can tell us a little bit more um, of the differences between the two personal statements, um, how did you tailor it for the program? Um, so it was 
basically the same personal statement. It was just the last paragraph. I kind of changed it up a bit. So I tailored it a little more to why I was interested specifically at doing like doing pathology at my you know program where I am right now and like why my values align with you know the program and like why I really wanted to go to that program basically. <laughs> oh that's awesome so it is possible to submit multiple uh, like personal statements um in ERAS. Program. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's a little trick. I would definitely like if you have like your number one program, I would definitely, you know, tailor that personal statement to that one program. Because I think it definitely increases your chances of like getting into that program or at least getting an interview. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so the last question would just be in general, um, any like recommendations or anything you'd like to say for UAG students right now? Yeah, so definitely I know like it's a really hard time with the pandemic and I know you know you guys are probably doing a lot of virtual classes so it's really hard to kind of get that I don't know that sense of like community but you know I really recommend you guys like help each other out. I know my class is really good about like you know always offering additional information like oh there's this program available for like AMSA or something you know and it would be publicized for the whole class it wasn't very cut there like oh there's something special going on I'm gonna keep the information to myself but I definitely recommend like you know you guys help each other out and I think because you guys are virtual um, I'm not sure what platforms you guys use but it would, be, it would be good to have like a virtual platform which kind of builds like a UAG community kind of help each other out um, something else I would recommend is you know um, to be proactive on like med Twitter just because I know there's a lot of like great connections you can make on there a lot of great information for example the open houses helped me a lot when I was like um, doing my ERAS cycle so that was very helpful as well um, and then another thing I just wanted to say is just, just be genuine be yourself you know don't try to be something that you're not like I think you know you'll, you'll find that one program that's the right fit for you and that's gonna take you for who you are and you know you're not gonna have to pretend to be oh someone like super academic and you know I think there's a program out there for everyone you know yes oh thank you so much I really appreciate that um because it helps I feel like it helps me personally to just like um align like myself I guess um towards towards like medical uh residency applications um, because I, I personally, I know that you said you had fun with the hobby section, but I'm kind of scared of the hobby section because I'm just like, I'm not an interesting person. Uh, so I'm really, I'm really happy that you just say, stay, stay genuine. Um, I appreciate that. And thank you so much for, for your time with us today. Um, everything that you said, I know helped me a lot and I personally will rewatch this video. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I wish you the best with your residency, of course, like of what you're doing right now. And then um, for anything that you have planned in the future, I know you're going to excel. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And like I said, I'm always happy to help, you know, UAG students. I always tell myself, like, if I make it out of this alive, like, I'm going to go back and like, help anyone that needs it. Aww. So uh, you can, like, definitely, like, um, I'll send you my email information and that way, like, you know, if you know of someone that needs help or mentorship, I can definitely like help out and you know, whatever you guys need, I'm here. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Alrighty. Have a good rest of your day. Alrighty. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.